Exploring post-war Appalachia, you'll discover a world full of strange creatures, dark secrets, and many random encounters. In today's video, I'll be going through 10 different things you may have missed, which were added with the Once in a Blue Moon update, including mysterious cipher codes, some new Atlantic City hints, and the origins of Appalachia's newest creatures. Let's get started. Up first today, we're talking about the Blue Devil, a large bipedal cryptid. It comes with a unique howl attack which forces you to run away unless you've topped up on some liquid courage. Alongside the Ogwa, the new cryptids have arrived in Appalachia, seemingly with no explanation as to how they got here or where they've been hiding. Although there is still a little bit of a mystery here, we can actually find answers for both of their origins, and for the Blue Devil it comes in the form of a series of cipher-coded messages. To begin this search, head over to the Blue Ridge Pit Stop, you probably first met the Blue Devil here while you were doing the event safe and sound. Head inside the central cabin, the Booz and Brahmin, and over to this terminal. This actually belongs to the proprietor, Clyde, the Mute Barman. And there are some very interesting entries on here which we'll be back to look at later on, but the one we want is the entry which has a title made up of seemingly random numbers and letters. Inside, a mention of an old code and a new code, and a message about fixing the repellers. Talking to Vera, or reading other terminals located here, you can quickly find out that Ares is responsible for installing the repellers and subsequently fixing them. Something he clearly isn't doing a very good job at, as the repellers emit a loud dog whistle each time summoning a blue devil to the pit stop. But exploring the pit stop area more closely, we can find more strange notes featuring coded messages. Just in front of the general manager's store by this truck bed trailer, you can find the weird note. And this note is written entirely in the code, and to actually transcribe this requires using the ciphers code we found on Clyde's terminal. Before running through that, heading outside of the pit stop to this location, you can find a second note. And this one is called Investigation Report, and it includes another word hidden by code. We'll be reading through this note more thoroughly momentarily, as it does offer some interesting insights into the Blue Devil's background. So, who is leaving these notes and why? And what do they say once the code has been cracked? Well, thanks to a player named Wasteland Walker, the code was actually cracked during the PTS itself, much to the surprise of the devs. I've left a link to the Reddit post detailing how he was able to decode this, and obvious spoilers ahead as we take a look at what the hidden words are actually saying. Starting with the terminal, the key to the cipher was Clyde, the owner of the terminal, and using this same code and reversing the letters in the weird note, it reads as follows. Clyde, my friend, let me know if you find one with white on it. I need a hunting companion for finding the mother. Now going back to read the investigation report note, this section reads as, Color variations are limited, especially local specimen. Dark black hair is most common, appearing almost blue in certain light. None were white, like you suggested. Taking everything together, it's pretty clear that Ares is actively trying to discover the origins of the Blue Devil, and perhaps more interestingly, potentially taming one for his own ends, Clyde being his eyes and ears on the ground. But the investigation report did reveal a lot more about these origins and some potential problems with Ares' strategy, so let's run through what we can glean from the note and theorize over this new cryptid's origins. Facing off against a blue devil, it does appear very similar to classic representations of a werewolf. This isn't a transformed human though, of course, so describing what we see, it could be the result of a mutation, genetic research, or most unlikely, an entirely new species of creature. Although Clyde's investigation does not name a specific species the blue devil originated from, he says that they used to be bred for racing and then fighting before the Great War. This continued after the bombs dropped, but Clyde has not fully determined a reason for the Blue Devil's immense size, compared to other canine-like creatures. Clyde goes on to say that the size could have something to do with that place and what's nearby, though the note does not clarify what that place actually is. I thought long and hard about what this canine creature might be. A particular breed of dog, perhaps even a wolf dog or a coyote dog given the wolf-like appearance, but as things stand, anything is currently just a guess. Clyde notes that Blue Devils are reproducing in the wild, but most pups are not healthy enough to survive. However, those that do survive grow very quickly, and are hostile even at a young age. As for the coloration of the creature, Blue Devils typically have dark black hair that appears bluish under certain lighting conditions. However, none of the creatures Clyde surveyed had white hair as Ares suggested. So, in terms of the location that could have something to do with the size, we do find, very nearby, Emmett Mountain Disposal Site. And this location is of course filled with attacking creatures during radiation rumble, and the high levels of radiation here could have caused something to mutate. 
But what do you think the Blue Devil is mutated from? Let me know your theories in the comments. For now though, we move on to the other new cryptid, the Ogwa. The Ogwa visibly seems to be exactly as real world legends describe it. An abnormally large snapping turtle, we actually learn the most about it from a series of notes located at the newly named Sacramental Glade. We arrive to assist Luca Costa and Beasts of Burden, but the cultist reasons for being here at the Glade are all to do with the cryptid. Near the entrance, you can find the note called A Worthy Sacrifice, and giving it a read, we learn that the cultists found the Ogwa and decided it was a worthy sacrifice for the Mothman. Its ancient blood apparently holding secrets of long ago. It's interesting that they think the turtle is ancient, and not a recently mutated snapping turtle. They mention that it has travelled south and that they trudged through the night in pursuit, with multiple unsuccessful endeavours during their hunt. This chase led both parties to the bog, with the Ogwa taking shelter here and the cultists doing the same. Presumably the Ogwa travelled south from the mire, which has the Potomac River running through it. Continuing on, we find a second note called A Blessed Gift, which details the events which led to Luca losing everything he was entrusted with. Recognising the opportunity that the foolish trader presented, the cultists believe this was a sign of the Mothman, and using a scheme involving a character called Elder Adelaide, who posed as a merchant herself, they ambushed Luca, taking his supplies, ammunition, and pack Brahmin, before noticing the explosives and planning to use them against the Ogwa. Ultimately, we took over from the cultists, putting them down in the process, but during the battle, look out for this spot where the Ogwa spawns, as you can find a cluster of Ogwa eggs sitting here in the dense undergrowth. Meeting the new cryptids is guaranteed during these two events, but if you're having trouble waiting for the events to pop up, or are eager to see them elsewhere, they both can spawn at random assault encounters. To find the Ogwa or Blue Devil out in the wild, I use this series of locations to check whether they will spawn at them. In the North Savage Divide, spawning at Hopewell Cave, and Bren running up to this shipping container is the assault encounter location I've had the most luck at for both. It's easy to travel to and to check, so feasibly you could just use this one. Loading into a new world each time, you're unsuccessful. Further north is the Carhenge unmarked location, which is also a spot I've had some luck at. Dropping your tent down close to this one, and pairing it with the cave location to check these two repeatedly is definitely an option. Elsewhere, these two locations further south in the Savage Divide have also given me some joy when trying to look for them. In the Cranby Bog, travel to the NAR repair yards for a quick check, or alternatively this spot just in front of the cultist camp, Blake's Offering, near K-Max Transmission. The assault encounter will take place just here. In the video's description, I've left links to a full map of these spots, if none of them actually worked for you. Now let's run through some smaller lore bites you can find in this update. Heading back to Clyde's terminal, there are some other interesting entries we can look at. Vera will tell us straight up that Clyde used to work with Vinny. And reading through the entry, Gonna Need a New Door, we learn about a bar fight that took place at the Boozing Brahmin. Raiders arrived to scout out the place to rob later, but they ended up arguing and fighting each other. Clyde eventually got out a gun to try and force the raiders to leave. Instead, one of the raiders ended up getting shot, and the other ran away so fast that they yanked the door off its hinges. Kit finishing with a concession that it reminded Clyde of the old gang, and he reflected that he was glad that he managed to get out in one piece. Well, mostly one piece. And the story behind how he lost his tongue is incidentally a mystery. But combined with the mentions of working with Vinny and his apparent connections to the mob, then perhaps that life had something to do with his accident. Raiders weren't the only visitors to the boozing Brahmin. In this entry, a much stranger visitor arrived, grinning from ear to ear wider than should be possible, they placed 10 caps on the counter one at a time. As this was the cost of a drink, Clyde handed them a beer. He sat by the fire and said nothing for hours, and the only sound that Clyde heard was a faint chuckle. This is clearly a reference to one of my favourite Fallout 76 characters, Injured Cold, the Smiling Man. Chirpy, creepy, and on the hunt for cryptids, this random encounter is a memorable one. Better the devil you know than the devil you don't. At least, not yet. Prior to the update releasing, Indrid teased the arrival of the Blue Devil long before it was officially announced, and it makes a lot of sense that he'd arrive at the pit stop, a location soon to be attacked by that same creature in the event safe and sound. Perhaps Indrid was watching the whole time, hidden in the trees chuckling to himself. Final word on Clyde's terminal, if you complete both missions, complete all of the cost of business dailies and project Adonais, then go back to check and there'll be a new entry there called That Dweller. And it's all about you and your exploits. Clyde thinks you're a badass, and it's nice to get some appreciation for once. Speaking of those cost of business dailies, let's go and have a chat with Vinny. 
Operations Manager Vinny Costa takes centre stage in the new Costa Business Dailies. Seven non-repeatable quests starring different members of the Blue Ridge Caravan, fixing whatever the problem might be for Vinny so he doesn't have to worry about it. But with an intelligence check of 10, you can actually access deleted employee complaints on Vinny's terminal. The complaints and Vinny's replies are actually quite funny. First up is his nephew Luca, and there's a hint to what transpires in Beasts of Burden as Luca asks to be removed from operations in the Cranberry Bog, which Vinny flat out refuses, on account of the fact that he's been making homemade cherry bombs and selling them under the table. Those homemade explosives featuring pretty heavily in the event. Eugenie asks to be paired with anyone but Kieran because of the little conversation they have during riding shotgun. Vinny's response, nah. Vera asks for more protection at the pit stop besides Clyde, and there's another hint to the event mentioning that something big is watching in the woods. She also suggests that they could dress up the Brahmin for battle, but doesn't think that they'd be much help in a fight. Vinny doesn't take the threat seriously, demanding that the Brahmin be left alone and not dressed up in anything. Last but not least, Ares. Vinny, why don't you like me? Response, N.A. Staying on Vinny's terminal for a moment, there are some other entries which were actually changed a bit between the PTS and the live service. If you take a look at Vinny Costa's terminal entries, you will also find a section about trade routes out of Appalachia. This entry entitled Western Routes mentions that the route has been blocked by clowns and their endless Halloween party. This is seemingly a reference to the Point Pleasant Bridge. The Northern Routes entry interestingly has been changed since the PTS way. It used to say this, uh, making a mention of the family, and we speculated in a previous video that this was a reference to the Mafia in the New Jersey area, which ultimately turned out to be correct, it would seem, courtesy of what the new ally Joey Bello has to say. In the live game it now says this though, anything near the coast is out of the question, too many burned bridges there, suggesting that Binny, the monster suit wearing Blue Ridge operations manager, might have had ties to the outfit located there as well. Speaking of Joey Bello though, let's take a look at something interesting that he sells. The latest ally Joey Bello is our best source of information currently about the future expedition Atlantic City. He's also not averse to cheating you out of some caps. Taking a look at his inventory, you might find him selling a note called Get Rich Quick. You can purchase that note to take a look, and congratulations, you've been scammed. As we discover giving it a read, but step one, write a Get Rich Quick guide, and step two, find a sucker. For now though, we are the sucker, but it does mention that why not pass it on. I'm not sure if this is a reference to some players selling notes in their vendors, but it was a nice little easter egg. Let's finish on some bigger ones though, as we finish up talking a bit with Joey about Atlantic City, and what we can expect to find there. You can pick up Joey Bello at rank 35 on the Shoot of the Stars scoreboard. His unique station is a stage, and taking a closer look at it, there's some interesting smaller details. You can find tatoes, discarded flyers, a swear tip jar, or even a pie. Upon setting down his station, Joey comes sauntering over, musing over something that's been eating away at him. Appalachia! Huh? Pleasure to be here. One of my favorites. Dates? Counties. What is this place? Now oh, forget it. How you doing? You look great. You can ask him about the name of his act. Joey Bello Live! And I aim to keep it that way. And he'll let you elaborate on what he does for a living. Eh, jokes. You know, knock knock, why the chicken cross the road? He's got jokes here in Appalachia, right? People pay caps to hear me crack wise, and I help them forget about their miserable lives for a few minutes. I'm not rocket surgery, but it's a living. But once he's all settled in, you'll have a selection of different dialogue options. If you choose to ask him to tell you a joke, then he'll do just that. And these are dad jokes mostly. But also lots of mafia themed jokes as well, which is pretty topical considering what else he has to say. Oh, check it out. What do you call a mobster who's gotten too many rads? A gabagool! Aside from those, you can also ask Joey about anything interesting he's heard in Appalachia. This will prompt him to divulge his thoughts on a random factional group like the Brotherhood of Steel. How many nights does it take to change a light bulb? Only one to screw it in, but an entire squadron to take it from whoever owned it before that. <laughs> or the Mothman Goltis. Come on, I heard Appalachia has its hillbillies, but you're telling me there's really a whole group of rednecks out here worshipping a giant bug. I mean, sure. The Pineys back home have their Jersey Devil, but at least you don't find them praying to it. This one was particularly interesting, I think, as he mentions the Jersey Devil and the Pine Barrens. Some probable foreshadowing, I think. But most interesting to me at least was confirmation that a post-war Mafia outfit is indeed operational in Atlantic City. If you ask him about where he's from, he says this. Well, short story short, 
I made a joke at a made man's expense, and he wanted payback. Thankfully, I got tipped off by a pal on the inside. Joey, you really crossed the line this time, he says. I know, I know. How much is it going to cost me to smooth things over, I ask. Two caps, he says. I'm thinking, two caps? Eh, that's nothing. What's the catch? Turns out, they wanted my kneecaps. Eh, I've grown pretty attached to my legs, so... I hoofed it out of town with just the clothes on my back and the caps in my pocket. Never believe Use them or lose them, right? It's a quick job. Joey, it transpires, was forced out after making an ill-advised joke about a made man. But is the mob still looking for him? Heard Teddy the Toe Taker was after me, but I doubt he tracked me this far. Don't worry, it's just a nickname. Teddy's actually short for Theodore. <laughs> Teddy the Toe Taker. I wonder if that's someone who might pop up in the expedition. Other speech options of Joey include asking about whether he wants to stay here. He will repeat what he says in the gossip line about Blue Ridge, but adds that he one day hopes that he will make it all the way to Vegas and then on to Hollywood. Hey, Next time you see no Joey Bello, it could be in gorgeous Panelux color, which I'm guessing is like real life, only better because it's made in Hollywood. But you can also find out a lot more about New Jersey. Before the big one? And my family lived in a small town on the outskirts of New Jersey, eh, back when I was just an ankle biter. After the bombs, it was just me and Ma left. And we stuck it out there for a while, you know, best we could, then made our way towards Atlantic City. Eh, she tried her best, but Ma just eh, wasn't cut out for life in the apocalypse. Her spirit died, and then her body joined it. I was, yeah, probably 11. Ma was always super supportive, though. Not Even sure. back then, when I told her I wanted to be a comedian, she just laughed so hard. <laughs> well, it took a few years and a few scars, but I eventually made it to Atlantic City. I started small, scored some gigs on the pier, even earned some caps. It's a hard knock life, kid. But hey, that's showbiz. So he managed to get some gigs on the pier, and that's the location we apparently see in the teaser trailer. And you can straight up ask about what New Jersey is like. New Jersey? Ooh. Freaking horrible. Poisonous chems on the streets, filth everywhere, people killing each other over a can of beans, and then the bombs dropped. <laughs> hey yo! Nah, I'm just talking smack. Truth is, it's not as bad as some places, and a hell of a lot better than some others. Atlantic City's a real good time if you got the caps. I'd tell you to tell them Joey sent you if you ever find your way to AC, but... It's probably a bad idea if you're a fan of having unbroken legs. Finally, you can actually straight up ask Joey if he takes a lot of chems. Well, I guess it depends on your definition of a lot. But uh, yeah, I'm something of a chem connoisseur. Started taking Day Tripper when I was still a kid. They say chems screw with your growth, but I was always short for my age, even before that. In fact, I was so short that when I took Day Tripper, I didn't even get high. I got medium. Yeah, you do. Go get him, Tiger. Hey, they have this stuff back in Atlantic City that makes Psycho look like bubblegum. I never tried it myself. You know, way out of my class. But I hear that shit's on a whole nother level. They say laughter's the best medicine. But let's be real. You ever find me bleeding now, you just go ahead and jab me with every feel-good chem you got. And there it is. A really strong chem that makes Psycho look like bubblegum. We know from the latest PTS that this is actually called The Devil's Blood. You can check out my video going over changes on the PTS as I went through a series of new holotapes that talk about Atlantic City and this new chem in more detail. For today though, that is it. Have you enjoyed the Once in a Blue Moon update? And what did you think of these discoveries? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this particular video, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. We have plenty more Fallout 76 videos releasing soon, so turning on the bell icon is definitely the best way to stay up to date. With that said though, I am off. Thank you for watching and we will see you in the next one.